Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick, and today we are continuing our conversation with Kyle Hendrickson, Director of Cybersecurity for Ig Bailey. And we're going to talk about something really interesting today. Oh, wait, I have to say, Kyle, every day has been interesting in Nonprofit Power Week. But I think this day and this topic is probably the thing and I've had a lot of hair and fire moments, but this has been the most shocking because we're going to talk about third party cybersecurity risk management. And it might not mean or be apparent to everybody, you know, as, as we define it. And so um, I can't wait to have this discussion. Um, so, Kyle, again, thanks for being with us. We're going to jump in with you very quickly. But in case you don't know who we are, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, my personal nonprofit nerd, the nonprofit nerd, CEO of Raven Group, is not going to be with us today. But she'll be back on tomorrow for our Friday Ask and Answer with Kyle. Again, this is Nonprofit Power Week. Jarrett and I only do this less than a handful of times a year, we pick topics that we feel like we really need to do a deep dive and then we find the right partner. I Bailey is that partner with us this week. Um, and so we're really excited to bring this to you. And our partners and sponsors buy into this and understand that this is what we're going to do. So we want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that pretty much all of them have been with us since day one, going back almost three years, um, to bring the nonprofit show to you every single day. Kyle, hard to believe it, but we are marching upon 650 episodes. We have almost a thousand video clips, um, which is crazy. To even think about that and you can access those on roku youtube vimeo amazon fire tv and then podcast we just started putting all of our content into pod podcast format so cue us up wherever you like to get your contact uh your con your content okay kyle hendrickson give us the weather report because every day we ask you and we're just mortified. Yesterday it was one below. It felt like one below. Uh, so today we're 45 degrees and sunny. It feels lovely outside. Oh my God. This okay. is t-shirt weather. This is awesome <laughs> fall t-shirt weather. Holy moly. Well, bless your heart because where I live, if it got that cold, we would have like emergency alerts coming across our TVs. I'm just saying, because that sounds mighty cold to me. Kyle Hendrickson, Director of Cybersecurity for Id Bailey. Before we move much further, and we've had you, Kyle, talking about cybersecurity, can you give us like the quick elevator speech about what Id Bailey does and who they are? Because I think the nexus between cybersecurity and Id Bailey as an accounting firm might not be so apparent until we start talking. Yeah, so I Bailey is a tax and audit firm that has its roots in a little over a hundred years now. So we we were here a long time ago. We're not <laughs> going anywhere. Uh, we're going to be here in the future. But along with being a trusted business advisor around tax audit and those other traditional finance related items that every business needs. Um, we also, again, becoming that holistic business advisor, we do specialty services. And so those specialty services include, um, if you wanna sell a business, we can help you through those transactions, both from either buying or selling a business. Um, we do business outsourcing processes. So if you need a, a CFO for hire or you need somebody to do payroll for you, we have those types of services. I fall into the group of technology consulting. Technology is a huge part of nearly every business. And so not just cybersecurity, um, we uh, implement ERP packages. So accounting solutions uh, as a software 
for clients. Uh, we work with CRMs like Salesforce and make sure they're customized and fit uh, a client's expectations. Uh, we do analytics for a large number of clients. And around that, it's really how do we turn your data into something that can drive your business and something that you can use? It's great that we have all this stuff, but if we can't use it, what value is it? And so right. that's where we want to turn every company into a data company. And, and so we have all these practices. I fit into the cybersecurity world. And so I help companies uh, from very large where they have staffs, they have chief information security officer type people, they have uh, people ready to respond to incidents and they just need some ad advice, um, some guidance uh, or help with specific areas of their program to small companies where they're just throwing their hands up in the air and saying, what do I do? What do I need to watch for? How can I make this better? And so we deal with big and small. You know, it's fascinating. And I apologize um, if you're hearing my phone ring. I forgot to unmute my, uh, my phone here in the studio. Um, I'm fascinated by this. And it, at the end of the day, I see a nexus between all of this once you start explaining it, because ultimately, these problems or issues, and I'm not going to say opportunities because in what we're talking about is the cybersecurity, it automatically becomes an accounting issue. It's not just about stealing money um, or what we think of as fraud. It's actually impinging upon how your, your organization works. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned um, from you today because I think before we really started uh, talking, I was all about, well, fraud is fraud and it's money. But what I've learned from you is that it's really the way you can operate your business, serve your community and your clients, interface with your, your employees, your volunteers, your stakeholders. So it's, it is financial, but it's much larger than that. And when we talk about fraud and financial risk management, again, that's just business risk. That's not financial risk. That's business risk. I feel very, I feel very strongly that cyber risk is business risk as well. These are things that can seriously mess with your ability to serve who you are trying to serve. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I, I feel like once you kind of pivoted the space with which I looked at this, it made this two things. <laughs> it made it more frightening because you can say, ah, I don't have that much in the checking account. What can they steal? Which is completely stupid, but I can see how we could kind of devolve into that. But when you kind of post the, the concept of time missed and time down and how you can't serve, that was when I was like, holy moly, this is a much bigger conversation. Um, so thank you for kind of helping steward that that theory for us so that we could dig in even deeper. So today we're going to talk about third party and, and third party cyber risk and why it's important. But since you've been so good at educating us from day one, can you start with what a third party is and what they look like, who they are? Yeah, so these are the solutions and the vendors that we work with to support the business. So it might be something um, like a lead generation company, or it might be uh, uh, in the case of a target breach that happened a long, long time ago. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, I believe it happened It happened in 2013, but it, uh, it, it came out in the news, I think, in 2014. So that's where I was getting my dates mixed up. But in that case, um, attackers compromised an HVAC controller. So somebody who was doing heating and air conditioning for uh, target locations and that vendor became compromised and through that they got into their point of sale system started capturing credit card numbers and, and as we talked about a little bit earlier here um, probably a large number of us watching this right now got new debit cards as a result of that and that was a very eye-opening experience to a lot of people. And from a business side of things, that was kind of the first wave of, oh, 
this is a risk now. We need to take this serious. If Target can go through this and they have all of those controls in place to protect and and make sure that they're reinforcing customer confidence in how they're protecting data, what do all of us need to do to protect that data? Yeah, I mean, and, and one point is how we started this conversation is that, you know, you think, oh, well, I run a food pantry. I have no connectivity in my business scope or place in this on this planet to target than the man on the moon. But I think what I've learned from you is that's just a lesson that we can learn from because an air conditioning and heating organization that came in and became that disruptive. I mean, who would have ever guessed this? And when we start thinking about the internet of things, so <sighs> are we doing sensitive conversations with donors or those types of things with uh, Amazon Echoes or Google Homes in the proximity? And are they recording our conversations? And how <laughs> is that data being protected? All these questions that are we doing the right thing to make sure that those people that don't want those those private details shared making sure we're protecting that. And, and that's an often unthought of thing when we start talking about smart home devices. Same thing about um, thermostats and other things that we have that we control with our smartphones. What happens if those types of things get compromised and have we properly segregated them from how we do business to make sure that there's no way if those types of things, which typically have very little security, if they're compromised, they can't be used to be that jumping off point into some of the systems that we care about, or how we keep track of our finances, how we keep track of our donors, mm -hmm. other things that we're using to keep track of what we're doing to how we serve those who we need to serve. Well, okay, so that just made my hair go on fire and it wouldn't be a day without Kyle Hendrickson if you didn't make my hair go on fire at least <laughs> once. So I get, I mean, you, you pointed some things out that I never thought of, to be extremely candid. Um, and it's only going to get more intense as as a society, as we, we rely more on our devices and we think this is how we need to behave and work and serve and all that. Okay, good to go. Understand that. But this then leads me into this question is how do we even understand who's doing this? Like, how do we assess those security challenges? How do we even begin to determine if the people that we're working with are, are protecting us in essence? So when we start <laughs> looking at vendor security challenges, let's say that we have an accounting system, an ERP, enterprise uh, resource planning type system that we're using to do all of our financials and keep track of things. Um, for example, most data isn't originating in that system. It's probably coming from other systems. So wow. if we're getting inventory and all of this other stuff that we're using to manage the the organization and that's flowing up to our ERP or our accounting system in some way so that we can get everything integrated, which is all of our goal to make things easier, more integrated. What controls are we putting in place to make sure that only what we think should be updated or only what we think should be manipulated can be manipulated by those outside systems? So if that's the case, how do we have that conversation? I mean, I'm looking frankly at my green screen behind me and, and, and the, the partners that we have whom I trust. I mean, I wouldn't have these folks on my screen if I didn't think they were good to go, reputable, honest companies, because that reflects back on me, right? But how do I, how would I go to one of these vendors and say, are you protecting me or what are you doing? I can't imagine that the people in, that I would interface with as a customer would even know the answer to that. Yeah, so we wanna start there and they can get us to the right spot. And so this is all about data. Mm -hmm. How are they protecting that data that they have as part of that relationship 
of working with you. So are they doing things like encryption? Are they protecting it with multi-factor? We hit pretty hard on that the other yeah. day. Yes. Are they doing those types of things? What other integration points do they have to you so you can make sure that you're asking the right questions around, is it only me that can manipulate or change this? And how do you protect my data from other people's data within your platform? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, so these are big questions and I'm going to go back to yesterday. For those of you who uh, were with us yesterday, we talked about cybersecurity insurance and we talked about mitigating risk via that. Are these questions or this process, would that be something that we could get from our, our cybersecurity carriers? So the same expectations that your cybersecurity insurance carrier has for you, that's an excellent spot to start asking those same questions for your vendors. Let's keep it simple. Let's focus in on what actually reduces risks. Mm -hmm. Another common thing that companies that are providing services, and this is something that we can think of for ourselves and request of those that we have a business relationship with, is a SOC report. So SOC 1, SOC 2, those type of assurance reports for secure before vendors to know that they're doing certain things and they've been uh, tested against those certain things mm -hmm. to make sure that they're protecting data safe. And okay. that's something that they do that they're able to share with their clients. So I'm kind of thinking about, you know, for so many of us in the nonprofit sector, we do events. And so we go to these, if you will, third party, you know, venues, we work with a lot of third party vendors. And a lot of times we are requested to provide um, our insurance certificate, or we get those certificates of insurance from the vendors that we work with. Is this something that this pattern that might fit into this mix? Yep. Yep. So uh, typically when we're looking at establishing um, a relationship with a vendor um, as a larger entity, we're looking for things like cybersecurity insurance, minimum requirements around liability coverage, those things that would put them at risk of not being able to serve us. Well, cyber or business risk is part of that. So we start looking at uh, a SOC report and, and SOC is spelled S-O-C and there's type one, type two, there's different flavors of all that. And it takes a little bit to try to understand what you're looking for, but that's the very first question is to start asking uh, from somebody that's providing uh, IT kinds of services to us is one of those SOC reports to understand what controls they have in place and are those controls working? Okay, so like not to be naming, you know, brands, but are, are you saying like, the the bank that we do our online banking and our bill pay or the company that we're like say an accounting software like quickbooks or something like that is that where we're looking at or would this be yep. more when somebody's coming in to physically be a part of what our our team is doing so it's a risk-based decision right okay. so uh we know that certain industries are known for protecting data better. They just are okay. forced to from a regulatory yeah. perspective. So banks, they're forced into doing a lot of things that they may not otherwise do. Yeah. Um, sure. they, they have the benefit of going through many, many, many years of dealing with regulators and audits yeah. and going through and proving that controls work and doing attestations. So I'm less worried about a financial institution as I am about uh, an IT vendor. So let's say um, if, if QuickBooks is hosting the data, I would be asking for how, what are the controls that you're putting in place mm -hmm. to protect my data up in the cloud? And it may involve the SOC report or it may not. It may be just, hey, this is the list of things that we do to protect your data. Just making sure that you're keeping that in mind and understanding that if there's something that you need to ask for or something that you need to implement that they offer, but they don't just do by default, that you're doing that. Okay, so put your catcher's mitt up because I'm gonna throw a curveball to you. I gotta ask you, my friend, how many clients in your world ask for the Ide Bailey sock report 
Does anybody ever ask you for this information? I don't have that answer. So I'm okay with saying I don't know. <laughs> so that tells me that people aren't asking. Well, they're not right? asking me. Yeah, they, but, but they would be reaching out. They would be reaching out to uh, somebody within our assurance group. Mm -hmm. But I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Yep. If it's that, I don't want to say new of a concept, but yep. maybe uh, it's it's that new of a practice of a best practice that we yep. that we are not just automatically thinking to ask for this um, assurance, this information that you know. Yep. It's it's really an interesting kind of time. Well, I think um, this is evolving, like what you're saying, wow. and that that target breach that happened way back in 2013, 14, it really changed things for a lot of large businesses. So anybody who is in a regulated industry, that was the start of being forced into doing vendor management processes. All of us outside of regulated industries now are starting to feel this coming on as well. And I think it's even more important now. So we look back at last year, 2021, there was two very high profile things that happened that kind of are a little bit eye-opening. So there was a company called SolarWinds that was compromised and SolarWinds is a software that IT people use to monitor and, and measure availability of systems. To, so if something breaks, they can jump on it right away and fix it before there's very much downtime. It's, it's a monitoring software. They got compromised and its own update mechanism. So how SolarWinds stays up to date in your environment was used to see malicious code uh, into client environments oh. and they use that to take over uh companies networks so when we're putting software out there understanding uh what kind of controls are in place to know what normal is versus not normal is an is a not it person trying to do it things those types of questions yeah very very interesting and that that is, uh, it, I, I think that just um, illustrates how you made this comment yesterday that this doesn't just happen. People have to get in and you use the word seed. You just used it again to seed this, this stuff into your systems across your devices. So then it can impact you. Um, so it's fascinating. We don't have a lot of time left. I mean, this time with you, Kyle, has just blown by. But ultimately, whose responsibility and liability is this? I mean, this kind of dovetails with what we talked about yesterday with risk, you know, insurance, cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. um, but how do how do we go back and say, hey, you know, in the case of, as I like to call it, Targucci, hey, you know, how did the HVAC company deal with all this drama? I mean, what does this environment look like? Yeah, so it all comes down to contractual requirements okay. and whose information is it? So us as okay. a nonprofit, do we own the information or is this information being provided to us uh, by another company? So like market research companies or, or okay. lists of prospects. Well, okay. those companies own that data. So if they have a breach, they are responsible for notification. We're just using their information. Now, if this is stuff that we have gathered from our clients and those that we have served, we own the liability. We own the protection. We need to make sure that even if we are using a, a third-party website or something that we bought and purchased and installed on our computer, yeah. that's our information. Are we protecting it the right way? Yeah, that's a really big... Um... That's a big question to understand, to ask and to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very interesting. You can see how the waters would get very muddy in a hurry here. Yeah, I can. And then um, something you mentioned earlier in the week, and I can't remember which day, uh, maybe you said it more than once, but also the jurisdiction, you know, d state to state, nation to nation, uh, GDRP for those working in Europe. Um, I mean, wow, very, very interesting. So we have responsibilities based on where our physical point of presence is. So we all have to be have an address 
in order to establish a business. And we might have physical points of presence across multiple states. So that matters where our businesses reside. It may matter where our employees reside. And it almost always matters on where the people that we have information on, where they call home. Mm-hmm. Well, and Kyle, this seems to me like this, um, this question in terms of structure is more amplified given that in the last three years, because of the pandemic and because of the opportunity that technology has afforded us, we are now securing donors and creating relationships outside of our little communities where we once did. I mean, I live in a state that takes, you know, it can take almost a day to get from the top to the bottom. And a lot of our nonprofits just worked within this tiny little radius of our municipality. And now we're bleeding. I can see it bleeding out and, and throughout the region, the country. Um, it seems like it just puts another layer of, I don't want to use the word complication, but something you need to be aware of. Yeah. And certain states are more difficult than other states. So California okay. and New York and I believe Massachusetts has different rules than the rest of us. And even the rest of the states, nobody can really agree on notification requirements and all of those kind of things. So until we have a federal law that supersedes all state law, we are in a a mess uh, of what we need to do uh, as far as if we do have a breach. Wow. So this kind of you know, makes it even more important, uh, you know, the discussion, understanding what this looks like. Ide Bailey has been with us throughout the week talking about cybersecurity, how this impacts the nonprofit sector um, from small to large organizations to independent one shop uh, organizations to multi chapter national structured organizations. If you've missed any episodes or you want to learn more about this or maybe share this information with your board or your team, go to thenonprofit.com and you'll be able to find um, the access point to our library of these episodes. It has been riveting and I feel like, Kyle, it is the start of a conversation that is quickly changing um, because of how we're more involved in this, this overall structure and just, you know, devious minds coming up with new new ways to, to to torture us i guess if you put it that way um kyle hendrickson director of cybersecurity for ide bailey um it has been really cool to work with you and hear all of these things this is the fourth day of our conversation you don't want to miss tomorrow kyle will be on with the nonprofit nerd herself Jarrett ransom on um, our special friday ask and answer And this will just be a day dedicated, an episode, I should say, dedicated to your questions and the questions that have come in. You can do those uh, live on the live broadcast, or if you want to uh, reach out to us again through the nonprofitshow.com, we'll get those questions queued up. Um, Kyle, it's been so interesting to have you join uh, myself and Jarrett Ransom this week. Really interesting stuff. And uh, I know that we will have conversations in the future because it's changing well and i'm looking forward to tomorrow's adventure because i do not know what those questions are in advance (laughs) well you know that's kind of a that's one of the things about friday ask and answer it's a little bit of a crapshoot um because they come in and they come flying at you left and right i think that's why jared and i like uh friday because it's it's it makes us like really be sharp you know, and sometimes we're not sharp, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Well, again, I'm Julia Patrick, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd will be joining us back tomorrow. Again, this has been another wonderful nonprofit power week, and we want to make sure that we thank our sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader and Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. As we end every episode, and especially after hearing about cybersecurity, we want to say to everyone that we partner with, who listens, who watches, who comes on like Kyle, to stay well, 
so you can do well. we'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.